Okay, welcome back. We are going to go through a bit of, this will probably be a bit of a longer video. I'm going to go through the basics of creating a scene. Uh, I'm not going to go through all walls and lighting and things like that. That'll be a different video. This is how to go about adding a scene in. So you've bought Foundry, you open it up, and it's just blank and full of buttons everywhere. One thing I've seen um, that I've felt about online guides to it, and I've seen um, a user talk about this on the Discord as well, is you can have a whole video that's 20 minutes long dedicated to just this one button and all the myriad of things you can do with it. That's great. It's not the sort of guide I'm looking to make here. I want to get you through doing a thing that you want to do, not just 20 minutes on a button. So we're going to make a brand new scene. Because I don't know where you're up to, or in case you're showing this to someone else, I'm not going to use a Curse of Strahd battle map, just in case it spoils anything. So this video is spoiler free for Curse of Strahd um, locations. Other than the fact you're going to see some things here. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Wind all that part back. Um, I'm going to go and create a new scene. And this menu pops up. So what do we want? I'm going to call this um, Lair of the Eye God. I can have it linked to one of my existing journal entries if I want to have that to read. Um, I'm going to go and choose the image that I want my map to use. And I'm going to select it. Now I could go through all the other I could go through all these other settings. I'm going to come back to this though, because I feel like you need to see the map that you're working on before you can start messing around with it. So when I click uh, um, save, you see up there the map appears. And when I click on that, it brings through and loads the battle map. So I've gone with quite a large battle map made by my friend here, so I don't have to worry about anyone suing me and having this video taken down for using their map. So thanks to the mad cartographer for letting me use this. He's also a player that I've renamed as Chad Cleric um, in the other videos. So opening this up, we can see we have the full size map. It is a gridless map, but it as you can see, there is a grid. We're going to look into that. So if I go back to my scene settings at the top left, right click, and I go to configure, that menu comes back. So we have all options to resize our map in here. We can choose to change the background color. So obviously the, the fading around the outside of it, and we can configure our grid. So by, by default, it's trying to overlay a square grid. I can change that. You can put it as gridless, hexagonal, things like that. Most maps are going to have a grid, but occasionally I'll have, like our Argon Rostol splash screen here, or the welcome screen I use for my campaign, that is meant to be a bit of a fancier image background. So on them, I've chosen for them to be gridless because Tokens are never going to move around on that. However, tokens are definitely going to move around in the layer of the eye god. Sorting your grid size can be a bit of a challenge. Now, I happen to know, because the mad cartographer told me, that I want my um, grid size to be 140 in this. So I'll do that in a minute. But if you didn't know what it had to be, you can click on the ruler and it will overlay the grid. And then you've got options where you can. Um, just as you can see here, hold Alt and scroll to resize your grid up or down. And you can also offset it as well. I spent ages typing in these offset buttons and it was a nightmare. But actually, if you just click outside this box and then use the arrow keys on your keyboard, it will shift them around for you. I find that to be much easier than just over typing numbers. So I want no offset. And because of the mad cartographer telling me, I know I want 140. Commit changes and it adds that grid resize in. We then have global light and vision settings. So these are really important for how you're going to navigate or have your players navigate this map. So, first one token vision. Restrict visibility on the scene based on control tokens and their vision. What it's basically saying is do you want people to see all of this map as soon as you share it, or do you want them to only see what their characters can see? based on the fact that we've just defined a grid in here, haven't we? Um, you can see that it goes off these settings up here in grid. A grid unit, it's going in feet. 
and a grid distance is 5. So it knows, locked down, that one of these squares on the grid is now 5 foot. That talks to things like the token vision we talked about in a previous video, which means that if I have 30 as my vision on my token, Boundary knows when your player selects that token, they can see 30 feet, which is 6 tiles on this map. It does all that work for you. That setting is good. It also means that if you don't have a player token on the map, they can't see anything. So if you're very, I was very worried when I started using this program that I would click on something or go to work on it or activate it and everything would get spoiled for my players. Um, if you don't have a token on the map, they can't see anything. However, for things like this splash screen that I use, you're going to want to disable that and mess around with these settings because they're not going to have a token on that map. I did that myself oh, like the day before I made this video. Um, was my player's first time seeing that splash screen. And when they went on, um, they, couldn't, they could hear all the background sound, which I'll cover in a second, but they couldn't see anything. Um, Global illumination. Do you want everyone to see everything all the time? Um, what that means is, do you want your players to be able to see what each other sees? So that's one of the first things we found with Foundry. I ran a test of Death House for my players. We've done it before, but we tested it again. In the old program we used before Foundry, I just revealed parts of the map. I didn't have player vision. So this was the first time they experienced one of them heading into a room in the north and one heading into a room in the south and then suddenly not being able to see each other. It was really funny. They were getting scared. Where are you? What room are you guys in? And as they were heading back, they couldn't find each other. That's really good, especially if you're going around somewhere like think about the catacombs in the basement of a certain house or walking around. A different multi-story, partially collapsed mansion. Players losing each other, fantastic for you as a DM, especially for the ambience that you can set up. Fog exploration. Do you want fog of war to creep in? I like how fog of war works in Foundry. Once they go around a corner, the place they've come from doesn't go pitch black again. It just goes dark and faded out. So they can kind of work out where they've been, but if they go around a corner, it doesn't stay revealed, so you can have a creature following them. Maybe that giant spider is moving down the corridor behind them. They're not going to immediately see it because they've explored there, but you can see it. Um, darkness level. What is the innate darkness level of this map? I never touched that in here. I'll go through how I handle lighting and darkness in another video later. We've then got ambience and atmosphere. Now, these aren't things I can set up now, but they're things we can come back to later. If I've created an audio playlist, you'll see in here I've got plenty set up already. Um, I can choose to have it automatically start playing that playlist when I activate this scene. I really like that most of the time. It's one, it's one less thing for you to do. However, if you have a map that might have multiple playlists at once. I should have closed WhatsApp before I started doing this. I'm very sorry. Let me kill that. I don't even know if WhatsApp's being picked up on this recording thing, but if it is, I've killed it now. Um, for example, if I had Argen Vostholt, which I'm not going to show you, I'm going to use it in name. I might want to have an. I'm, I'm using the ground floor outside map as an example. I might want outdoor wind, rain, ambience, the howl of wolves, things like that. When my players open the front door and they head inside, I don't want all that wind howling still playing. I'm going to want to transition to an interior playlist. Same for, you know, the opposite. I don't want the creaking floorboards and a crunch of stone underfoot and spooky moaning of revenants. If I'm then going to go outside into the graveyard, Everyone stood in the cemetery and you can hear floorboards. So for some maps, I don't think that's appropriate um, to have anything in here. You can handle the sound entirely through the sound menu. For something like wading through fields in Berez and boggy marshes, great, because you know you're going to have the buzzing of flies and swamp noises the whole time we're on this scene. 
So think about it before you put a playlist in here. Is that playlist going to want to play everywhere on this scene? Exactly the same for weather. So it's snowing in my campaign now. And it will probably snow for the rest of the campaign. So when they turned up outside Argon Vostolt, I want I put a snow effect on. But again, once they open the front door, and, and this applies it to the whole scene. So once they opened the doors and they walked inside Argon Vostolt, it was still snowing in the foyer. So I had to come in and change it. So I found a different, a better way of doing that, which I'll highlight in the future for you. So again, for all of this ambience and atmosphere, just keep in mind that it might be, you know, it might apply all the time. Access. As a DM, you typically want this to be GM only. When you choose to activate it, it will open up for a player. I don't really want my players able to click through my scenes, and I don't, I don't really know a scenario where you ever would. Um, if you were running this hosted, so it's available all the time, maybe you might have a scene for maps of town set up you want them to refer to. But for the most part, at the end of a session, I go back to my welcome screen scene and I activate that and I leave that as the active scene until we're playing again. So if players do join, they're locked on the welcome screen. I'll click save. And we've got our map set up. As I mentioned, this is not a video where I'm going to go through walls and terrain and lighting and things like that. What I am going to do is show you how our tokens work. So down here in the, this fenced off prison area, we're going to say, is where Chad Cleric wakes up. So I want Chad in this scene. Now you can create a folder structure for your NPCs, um, well for your actors. So I don't know if you can see this, sorry, but the Windows recording button kind of conceals it a bit for me. If I click on party, I've got a section for my characters and I've also got a section for summons. So NPCs, if I right click on one and go to configure permissions, can be given owners. This is great for things like spiritual weapons and familiars. So one of my players has a spiritual weapon. I've created that NPC. You can see it's a glowing purple rapier. I've given it a low level um, dim light. Nothing that they're going to use mechanically, but just because you see it glows purple. Well, it glows purple a bit on the battle map now. Um, and something I really like about that, the, the specific example of spiritual weapon, is instead of him having to avoid re-rolling the spell and using a spell slot every time he wants to open it up to roll the attack, I can give that spiritual weapon its own movement and I can give that spiritual weapon its own attack, um, which does the damage as force damage automatically. So he gets to move it around the battle map. And it doesn't have to have its own initiative. It doesn't have to be in the initiative order. But it means that it's something that he can move. Everyone's been at a table where people have tokens, or whether it's a, a, a physical table or playing online. Spiritual weapons and familiars are always a bit of a vague concept that people just say, oh, well, my spiritual weapon's going to kind of drift over there. Or even more likely, you forget your spiritual weapons up for a bit. With this, it has a presence on the map. The player is responsible for moving it, not you. And the player has a quick link to things like the attack. Um, I've also got a section for my characters, which is my NPCs. Oh, sorry, not characters. Um, my Curse of Strahd actors. I've got these set into monsters of particular types, um, NPCs, I've not got too many in there yet, and locations. So I can click into, I'm not going to go into locations because that's spoilerific, but I can click on a type of monster, open it up, and I can see things that I've made in here and just drag them on. So going off our previous video, Chad Cleric is here. I've dragged him on. Now you'll see when I click on him as a player, it automatically applies his vision so I can see what he sees. I'm also going to add in Mecha Blinsky from our previous video and now they're both on the map. I can move them around, I can control the player. Um, player movement can be done by dragging them but it can also be done with the arrow keys. You may notice I've got a really handy module enabled for top-down tokens called About Face which means when a token moves in a direction it rotates the, um, the token to face that way. That's really invaluable for me. Uh, my players find it very useful. 
So, opening this up, you can see there is, this is a very large map, there's a lot to do. My next video is going to cover going through walls and lighting and sound effect. Not for this whole map, but this is a very, very big boss encounter map. So it would take quite a while to go through everything in there. I'm just very aware I don't want to use things that are spoil and curse of Strahd content. So the next video, or one of the next videos, will cover how to set all of those things up. And then I'll think, well, I'll wait for some feedback from you guys. I'll see if you want a video on combat or what sort of features you want next. So yeah, thank you very much for watching and catch you next time.